Mr. Amrine? Here. Mr. De Leon? Here. Mr. Ferrara? Here. Mr. Kuhar? Here. Ms. Rosenberg? Here. Ms. Schaefer? Here. Mr. Sidoti? Here. Mr. Turner? And, and Ms. Wallach? Here. Okay, Dave, I take it Bridget's going to speak to the public hearing? Mm -hmm. All right. Bridget's got it. Okay. In accordance with the requirements of Section 111.05 of Part 11 of the Kent Codified Ordinances, also known as the City of Kent Zoning Code, the Kent City Council is conducting this public hearing to afford the public the opportunity to comment on a proposed amendment to the city's zoning district map that, if authorized, would allow 3.191 acres to be rezoned from its current industrial zoning district designation to commercial downtown. Okay, at this time, I understand this is in committee, but does anybody from the audience have comment on it other than what's in the committee time? You need your name and address for the record. My name is John Flynn, uh, address 1491 River Edge Drive, Kent, Ohio. I'm the attorney for Nipano, the uh, applicant here, and I'm going to reserve my time to speak after other people have spoken, either in favor or against it. I'd introduce Tom Myers, the owner of the company Nipano, uh, again, the applicant. Name and address for the record, please. Like singing here. Um, Tom Myers, uh, 1750 Oak Hill Drive, Kent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, are the owner of a piece of property off of Franklin Avenue at the corner of Franklin and Summit. Uh, we've owned this uh, in the family since about 1943. As far as I know, there were two, uh, three other owners of the property. Uh, one was um, John Brown um, of our city. One was uh, Mr. Kent, and I think after that it might have been the Seneca Indians. So we've owned this property for a while. To give you a visual reference, uh, I don't have an easel here, so I'll kind of uh, show it here. We have a, a piece of property that is in, in total uh, 15 acres, a little bit over, actually. Hey, Tom. Yes. We're going to discuss this with the committee. If you want to do this in committee, or would you rather do it now? John, what do you think? Well, I'm, I'm not we're, sure. Go ahead, John. Sure. When you say we're going to discuss it in committee versus now, I'm not sure what the difference Well, the, the administration will put on a, a, a presentation, and uh, then we'll ask for public comment about that before they take a vote. Wait until then? Yeah, sure. All right. I mean, it's up to you. Okay, so we'll wait until then. I think that's We'll wait for that. All Thank right. you. Is there anybody, anybody else have comment about the public hearing? So then JD is Seeing none, <coughs> close for the public hearing. Uh, we're going to go to the committee of whole. Uh, we have a couple boards that we're going to uh, interview tonight. Bear with us. The first one is Paul Simon. I'm going to reapply for the BZA. Will you come up and name an address <clears throat> and tell us why you want to be reappointed? Okay, cool. Then we may have some questions for you. All right, fine. Paul, Paul Selman, 1138 Aaron Drive, Kent, Ohio. I'm a lifetime resident of Kent. Uh, I've served on the BZA board for many years, and I think I've been able to contribute significantly to its success. Uh, the current board, when my term expired in February, actually has been a very well-functioning group, uh, the five of us. Um, through confusion and a decision that I made and then rescinded the said decision, and some confusion, my original app got lost. So I am reapplying. Again, but I'd like to get back on BZA. I think I can contribute a lot to the, the city. I'm also kind of the resident historian of the BZA. I can't go quite as far back as Mr. Myers did, but I can go pretty far back, too, on what properties have been. And I think that lends a background to some of the decisions that we make when we're granting zoning variances of what the property was or what it's going to be. Yeah. Cool. we have questions? When? Uh, so, 
Paul, the applications are brief, so just if you could just give me a sense of some of the things that you feel that you could bring to the position, please. Thank you. Oh, well, I think the biggest thing is the fact I live here, and other than my military time and a brief stint in Ashtabula with my prior employer before the school district, is I know Kent. I believe in Kent. I want to see Kent grow. It's been exciting to be part of the growth that's been downtown so far, and want to see and continue that. Um, I work for the school district. I've been there 17 years and intend to stay there a few more years. And it's another way to give back to the community and make Kent the great place that I grew up in and raised children in. Does, thank that, you. does that help? Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, Paul, we're going to vote at the uh, April 17th meeting, and each applicant needs five votes to win the position. Cool. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's it for the BZA. We have one for the Sustainability Committee, Rini Roneski. I apologize if I butchered that last name. <laughs> yeah, the first time. But it's not the first time. It won't be the last. <laughs> no. Same thing, name and address, and why you want to be on the Sustainability. My name is Renee Rahutsky, CH like Hanukkah. <laughs> um, I live at 237 Highland Avenue. Uh, here in Kent. I have been a Kent resident since 1985. Um, I am very interested in the Sustainability Commission. Uh, sustainability is one of my passions. Um, I love living in a livable community the way Kent has been transformed over the past several years. Uh, there's not a downtown anywhere. This is walkable and safe, I think, um, and beautiful and wonderful, and I want to help keep it that way. I'm committed to affordable housing. We recently became landlords. Um, we also rehabbed an older house in Kent, and we would like, would like to continue to do that. So um, making sure there's nice affordable housing is something we, uh, I care about and my spouse does. Um, we're environmental uh, uh, fanatics, maybe. Uh, we have solar panels, an electric car. We have a food forest in our backyard. Apparently, the record courier is using our photo as a stock photo for anything <laughs> solar these days. Um, <laughs> and I'm also very uh, concerned about culture and community. And a livable community really depends on its people. And I think that's the gift that I would bring to the commission is I'm very much, my profession is helping uh, communities become more um, connected with one another and more purposeful. Okay, do we have questions? Yes. Heidi? Yeah, um, what in particular would you contribute, do you think, to the Sustainability Commission? Have you, for example, have you been following what they've been doing and what do you think you might bring on board? Um, I've been following pretty closely. I know that they um, earlier on they did a lot of research and data crunching, and they're moving into more of an implementation phase, and that's where my gifts would be more helpful. So I see myself as helping to um, uh, capture the essence of why um, sustainability is important, make it a cool thing to do. If the you know if, if it's the the thing that people feel connected to and it's just something that you do as a normal part of life, that's what I would like to see happen. And the messaging and um, the providing examples and opportunities for people to do the right thing um, will help Kent become more sustainable. Any further? Gwen? Can you just speak briefly about balancing sustainability uh, concerns and economic development and, and business? Yes. Uh, again, um, I, I have read a lot of books around what, what makes a community sustainable and like jobs is important. Um, in balancing jobs and having a livable place is, are both important. So we want to make sure we have um, good paying jobs that um, enable people to buy things locally and support the local businesses. Um, it, I love that we now have a better relationship between the city and Kent State. That was not the case when I moved here. And it seems like more people want to live in Kent and work in Kent. And if you live and work in the same city, you can maybe walk to work, which is a good thing. So really having a, um, I don't want to say self-contained, but really having a lot of everything you need right here and it all interacts with one another that would enable our city to be uh, kind of a model of how you can live and work and shop and everything locally and i would support all of that together thank you yeah. roger 
Uh, Renee, how, how do you, you have great passion for, uh, for uh, sustain, the sustainability. And th there, are, there are people in the community who really almost, uh, you know, it's almost like talk to him. We don't want to talk about <laughs> sustainability. How do you engage those, those people uh, to develop understanding? Because certainly they're all of our citizens. And I think it gets a little bit to what Gwen was saying about, you know, balance. But how do you begin to have those conversations with those people who are less than uh, um, open to, to those type of conversations? Yes, it, that's the tricky thing, isn't it? Really, story is one of the best ways to communicate, is to tell stories about um, changes. Like, I can tell the story about the day I realized I should recycle. Um, and it's a, it's a, tr a story of transformation. And... Um, becoming our best selves. And so I think there are ways to cast the story of um, in, in individual stories into a larger story of Kent being you know, a city that can show what it, um, what it can be to be both prosperous and committed to sustainability. Because if you can show both, both of those things, it's a winning combination and it's a story with a happy ending. Thank you. Mr. Kuhar. Kent's a pretty old city, so there's a lot of people that have been around a, a while, and you have a, it's obvious that Kent's not on the high end of the income scale. So in this balance, you know, a lot of things in the development that's going on now are more middle to high end. How do you bring the balance together for sustainability when you have families of low, lower end income and a city that's being built on the higher end? I, I love that question because part of sustainability is reminding ourselves that we can produce some of our own food. We, you know, I always grew up with a garden <coughs> in the backyard and we put up tomatoes and things like that because I grew up in a not, um, you know, I, we did not have a lot of money growing up. And so there is this return to understanding that we're connected to the land, which is really a, a uh, self-sufficiency um, story in and of itself. So, you know, the, the idea of the victory gardens back during World War II, I think we should, you know, there should be another kind of uh, story of telling about how we can grow a lot of our own food for ourselves in our, in our own backyards. And one thing, you know, even those, who, you know, in our, in our city, we have a lot of houses with lots where you know people could grow a few vegetables or whatever in the backyard so i think there's an opportunity for everyone to reconnect to that sense of self-sufficiency that we've lost over time Those little pieces so you, so you actually have two environments within one environment yeah exactly anybody else thank you. okay thank you again we'll we'll vote on the 17th and thank you have a good one. That's it for Committee of the Whole. I'm adjourned. Craig Seifert. 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 Craig Seifert.
code it can get really expensive. <laughs> Balancing between what is absolutely <coughs> necessary, and I know that, that you know, sometimes there, is, there could be interpretation. Um, how do you balance that when, when, you, when you're looking at, uh, at building? Well, so first and foremost, as a, as a board that uh, sees variances and not necessarily is reading the code and interpreting the code, you have a, a city staff that does that, right? And, the, and I'll have to say that based upon this being, again, my, would be my third term, uh, the, the city building department really does a wonderful job of, of dealing with people that are building in the city. And um, so that way, in, in effect, what happens is our board doesn't meet that often. We've met an, a couple of times basically for riparian setback scenarios. And so uh, the first thing you want to look at, whether it's the building code uh, in my line of work, the zoning code, which the Board of Zoning Appeals or the Planning Commission would look at, um, or if it's something that's coming to us, you, you have to look at the different aspects of what's going on because it is a variance. So the people are coming to this board because there's something that the rules either didn't anticipate or it, it, it's a situation where uh, you need to um, think beyond the rules. So uh, at, at that point, you're looking at it and saying, what, what is the life safety factors? You know, what issues are there with life safety? Are we creating something that it makes uh, for a less safe situation or is there a safe situation that's being created by granting this variance? Uh, what are, what's the feasibility of what the variance is? Uh, cost, whether it's a building variance or a zoning variance, is, is really not, as to me, that much of an issue. It's a life safety issue. So that, that's in, in my line of work when I've had to go to a board and stand in front of it and ask for a variance. The first thing we do is we sit down with the local municipality and <coughs> walk through, you know, what the different possibilities are, what, what options are there and what is the least variance that you can ask for and cost really doesn't become an issue because life safety tends to trump that overall. Thank you. Yes. John? I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. So, suppose someone is coming in and they're appealing a decision made by the building or the zoning department and what they're appealing is a gray area decision where the code states this must be done this way or it can be done this way, but as everything else, it's at the discretion of the building official. How would you handle something like that? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is have a conversation with the building official and see what their per particular point of view is on that. Uh, a lot of times they are they are they are taking the code and somebody is has interpreted it the way they think it is they're interpreting it the way they feel it is and and now it becomes okay you've got a building official typically you would have the fire department would probably be involved also so there are other people that service department might be involved so there are other people in the city that are going to come together for whatever the issue might be on the table uh, I would have that conversation with them and say first of all if, if do they support it? Do they support the variance? Because they're really, their role sometimes, they can't, they can't grant variances on their own. That's the whole purpose of the board. But they may agree with the applicant in saying, okay, you have a unique situation here and it doesn't fit the code. You have to go to the Board of Building Appeals. So again, they're, they, would, they would make a recommendation about what their feeling is and then, you know, now it just becomes knowledge and experience of, of, of what our collective interpretation of the code is, and that's why there's numerous people on the board to vote. And, you know, like here, if it's a uh, majority vote, it passes. Thank you. I think that's you know why there's an architect on the board, there's a contractor on the board, there are members of the public on the board, and there's an electrician and a, and a heating contractor. So it really covers, you know, a wide spectrum of different professional um, opinions. John? Anybody else? Okay, thank you, Greg. And again, yeah. I apologize, but not a problem. We're going to make a vote on the 17th. All right, very good. Thank you. <coughs> I'll try this one again. We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> land use. Where? I've called to order the land use committee, and uh, we've been asked to pull item number two, the NEFCO sewer service. So that's been pulled from the agenda. 
and we've got the um, 200 West Williams rezoning and I'll turn it over to the staff. Yeah, this is an item that the Planning Commission had voted on. Uh, you got a preview, Tom gave you a preview, like the trailer of a movie, um, but that's, so we're gonna cover the issue now and uh, you know, the Planning Commission did approve it, or did recommend your approval of it and I'm sure Bridget will cover all the details, but um, tonight's the night where you're sort of being asked to consider this zoning and I know there are people here to speak to it, so we'll let Bridget go ahead. Yes, as Dave mentioned, at the February 5th Planning Commission meeting, a recommendation was made to you to approve a rezone request of just over three acres from its current zoning designation of industrial to commercial downtown, or CD. That recommendation was made with a condition, and I'm going to read the condition specifically as it was worded in the motion whether the use is permitted or conditionally permitted, any parking plan for this parcel on-site or off-site must be submitted to and approved by the Planning Commission. I'll explain why that condition was added. The commercial downtown district does not require parking on-site. There is no mandated parking requirement, which is typical of most commercial downtown zoning districts. They just need to provide a parking plan. That plan is basically just almost treated as informational in use. Um, because this is a proposed extension of the uh, commercial downtown district and the area does um, is located in an area where there is already residential streets that do not provide for the same type of parking on street mechanism that you see in the downtown, that condition was added to ensure that regardless of what the project is, that parking on site could be evaluated or if it was proposed for off site, that could be evaluated based on the use. As a reminder, we have not had a rezoning request before you in, in a few years and in addition, some of you are new. The rezone request cannot be based on one use. You have to take into consideration all uses that are currently in place, permitted and conditionally permitted in the industrial, which would be removed and replaced with all the permitted and conditionally permitted uses that are allowed in a commercial downtown district. Um, as a reminder, permitted and conditionally permitted are the two categories of uses. For simplicity's sake, permitted typically means if they meet these requirements, the project is okay. It is a, an allowed use based on the nature and um, adjacencies of that zoning district. Conditionally permitted uses are those that have additional conditions that need to be considered and evaluated by the Planning Commission based on the complexity, nature, or variables of the project. At this point, I can take questions with uh, regards to the material that I disseminated in the packet. Ms. Wallach. Uh, there's on page three in the packet under 1111.03b, uh, number five, I think that there might be something missing. I believe that what this is talking about is that residents in the area have to be notified of the change and they have to give their permission to allow it through. Is that correct? No, they have to be notified of the, the request for the rezone. So it, with both the Planning Commission and City Council, uh, certified notices went out to every property owner within 500 feet of the proposed parcel. Um, we do apply that very conservatively, and even though this is just a proportion, a portion of a much larger 15-acre site, we actually did all properties that were around that 15-acre site. So if you're within 500 feet of any side of that parcel, you were notified of the Planning Commission. That was about <coughs> 150 mailings. Those same mailings went out again because our zoning code requires that city council, the clerk of council technically, sends notifications out about the public hearing for it to, that is before you tonight. So there were two notices that went out. There is not an approval mechanism for the residents. There's a notification requirement for the residents. So then that's all, they're just notified and, and if they want to speak on it, then they come to either the planning commission or the council or whatever. Correct. So if they have an objection. Correct. They also can submit in writing. If we had written comments, those are read into the record at the Planning Commission. I do not. I did not receive notification from the Clerk of Council that any written um, correspondence was sent on this matter, so I'm assuming that there was not. Did you get it? Oh, no, there was not. Thank you. So. Okay, so there were no comments sent from the residents. 
There were a few that spoke at the planning commission <coughs> meeting. Um, more were inquiries, and those are part of the planning commission summary minutes, but they also re received a notice about tonight's meeting, so they may be present to speak again if they so choose. So then you didn't hear anything negative from the residents or anything? We basically, there were comments made at the planning commission. Um, I'm not comfortable categorizing whether they were negative or positive. I can tell you there were some inquiries and questions changing it from industrial to the uh, commercial downtown district, what that would translate to in possible proposed uses. Um, as the assistant law director and I pointed out, it cannot be specific to one use. Um, the review has to be in totality of all those uses. Um, those comments were taken into consideration by planning commission that evening and the recommendation was set forth as it is presented tonight anything further yeah. mr Kuhar. Uh, <clears throat> bridget the original downtown parking plan which was basically there isn't any which evolved to uh well you have to show us where you're going to park which was a slight improvement of not good um now, my only concern is, is that we can't, or we, or can we mandate the parking issue and not look like we're picking on somebody because they got more land? Well, let me, the, the condition that is specified in the motion from Planning Commission addresses that matter. Because it is where there isn't really on-street parking available, the Planning Commission basically is requesting through their recommendation and their motion that council, if they <coughs> authorize the rezone, that they uh, authorize planning commission to approve any parking plan, either on-site or off-site. So in other words, just being informed of it, as they do it with the commercial down downtown district, this rezone would have a covenant associated with it. So any use that goes in, and the covenant would be filed with this parcel, will be subject to that. There, this is not precedent setting. We actually, the, the way that this discussion came up is uh, we highlighted that this was done on a parcel down by Malloy in 261. A developer had proposed a rezone that would have allowed for multi-family um, dwelling units. There's covenant language filed with that that restricts it to single family per unit and doesn't allow it to be basically on a rent per bed model. It also limits density as in the composition of the residential structures. So that rezone was approved, but with those covenants. So anytime someone comes in to look at that parcel, we actually share those, those, those covenants, those deed restrictions with them and let them know that parcel is available, but these conditions need to be met. So what you're saying is no matter what comes in down there, uh, we're going to look at it as are they going to create a parking problem or a parking solution? Basically, if you approve the, if you make the, the uh, adopt the Planning Commission's recommendation as presented, Planning Commission will have the authority to approve or deny a project based on whether or not they agree with <clears throat> the parking plan that is proposed by any subsequent use. Because yeah, right now, right across the street from that, we have legitimate uh, structures that don't have enough parking for the people that are in them. That was why the, I believe the Planning Commission moved in this direction to put that condition on their recommendation to you. Okay. Further questions? Mr. Sidoti. Yeah, Bridget, so the, tonight what we're considering is to, to change the zoning in that covenant that's attached to that. Whatever the use is going to be, they have to go back to Planning Commission to submit their request for whether it's a, uh, you know, if it's a conditional use or if it's, you know. So Even without that condition, they would need to come back to Planning Commission. Right, because right, it, right. Right. And so what I guess I'm asking is, so they're, it'll be preloaded that, that, that if we change this, they're automatically going in with that covenant. That, Correct. That's part, no matter what they decide to do with that piece of part, or that parcel. Correct. And with, un, unlike the rest of the commercial downtown, where they just report on the parking plan, this gives the planning commission the ability to, even if it is a permitted use, to make, to deny a site plan review if they do not agree with the proposed on-site or off-site parking plan that is presented with that proposed redevelopment and, use. And is that regarded... Is that regardless of whether it's a conditional or permitted use? Yes, it is for conditional and permitted uses as well as on-site or off-site parking plan. 
So we covered all the variables that for any project that would come before the Planning Commission. Thank you. Schaefer. Yes. Um, so if the rezoning does not pass, the the um, uh, the property owners would have the ability to um, uh, sell the property or build themselves um, anything that is in compliance with the industrial usage, such as warehousing, um, potentially a plastics factory, those kinds of things could go into that space without um, a parking plan or may, no, no, because it would those, have to have a parking correct. plan. But it, but still, those those uses could occur. Every permitted and conditionally permitted use that is listed in Chapter 1155 that was in the memo before you, mm -hmm. it would be an allowed permitted and conditionally permitted uses, and all of those come with the same restrictions related to parking setbacks and all the other conditions that would be applicable in an industrial. So it stays the same. It stays what the zoning has been on that site. Okay. Mr. Kuhar. Um At one time I used to know this information. I wouldn't have to ask the question, but where the existing downtown perimeter line, where does that touch in that neighborhood? For the commercial downtown district, are yeah. you saying? It stops basically on the uh, north side of Summit. So where the farmer's market is would be on the, the north side. So okay. this would then, and just the adjacency, we do not take into consideration right of way. So right of way is allowed to, even though that would separate it, it would extend <coughs> across the right of way. And now my recollection, recollection rec anyhow, <laughs> tells me that the code requires anything built within one block of that line has to be a masonry structure. Is that still correct? Um, I am not aware of that condition. Um, like if, you that want to, if you were a residential house, you were a block away from downtown, you, and you want to put a garage up, it would have to be a, a masonry garage. That may have been under some, it is definitely not in our zoning code requirements. Um, and I will say it may have been in some local building code requirement we had, but we've adopted the Ohio building code as our code. And I, as long as it meets Ohio building code, you would be able to add an accessory structure, as long as you met, of course, the setback requirements and went through that process. Okay. I'm unaware of that one. And then now in this particular area that we're looking at, would those all have to be masonry? Uh, foundation buildings? I do not have any condition in the zoning code that would require that. And based on the structure itself, it would be, a, it would be un applicable to Ohio Building Code requirement standards. So, okay. so there's no require that you know of, there's no code requiring downtown development buildings strictly masonry and metal? No, no local code that I'm aware of, and I'm really not familiar with any building code. I think that's based more on the structural nature of the project. Yeah, I'm old. It might have been a while. Yeah, I know we did have some one a long time ago. Anything further questions from council? I'll go to the audience and allow Mr. Myers to give his presentation. We normally allow three minutes uh, for co public comment, but with your presentation, we'll certainly give you the latitude to finish. <clears throat> and comments and questions need to be directed to council, please. Uh, let, me, let me start again. Um, thank you. Name and address again also for the record. Just Tom Myers, 1750 Oak Hill Drive. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll save you the Seneca Indian statement. Um, the property that we're talking about is a, fi a little bit over 15 acres. Uh, what you're looking at here is Franklin Avenue. The post office is sitting in here. Uh, this is uh, Summit Street. Farmer's Market is just off the page. Familiar with this? Okay. Um, what we're trying to do here is to uh, divide off a parcel of this overall property that's about uh, just a little over three acres. So it's in this rather irregular shaped area. Here's the railroad track down here. And um, we have done some survey work on that. In a larger scale, um, this property looks uh, like this. So here again is Summit Street. 
Franklin Avenue is running up this way. Uh, the cul-de-sac that everybody, I think, here has probably gone down and turned around and mailed your letters. Uh, <laughs> our existing drive into the remainder of the property is all, also off of that cul-de-sac going into our manufacturing company. This property here would remain industrial. This property is what we're trying to ask uh, council to uh, recommend for a commercial downtown district. Clear? I show this last chart to explain, put it in the same direction here. Um, it's a challenging site. This is a, a topography map here. You can see there's a uh, embankment that runs along here. Uh, this property has never been used for industrial purposes. Yes, there's been uh, railroad lines that have run across it, but there's never been a functioning industrial facility on this property ever that I'm aware of. There was, however, a hotel at the top owned by John Brown that I referred to earlier. Very difficult site to use for any kind of an industrial purpose because of the topography, among other things. And I think there might be others that speak to that point. So this is the overview of the property. I may have a few uh, comments later on. I don't want to take any more time than is necessary. Are there any questions on this? Mr. Kuhar? Uh, most likely, this is prior to your ownership, but Davy Compressor Company utilized that for a testing ramp for their compressors back in the 60s, I believe. That's they have a railroad there. And then at the end of that property, Kent Coal Company leased it, and they had coal on both sides of the street. So Right. That would have been a commercial operation there, mostly. Yeah. Uh, Davy Compressor was uh, owned and started by my grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're absolutely correct. Up in this area, there was a uh, what they called a hump test mm -hmm. that where they uh, basically tested uh, chains and binders to make sure that things didn't fall off the hook. It's kind of industrial. But my question is this. Uh, have you given any thought, or maybe that's out of the realm of why we even look at this, of having the entry to that property, or at least one entry to that property off the cul-de-sac versus a little more busy intersection? Yes, in fact, uh, what we have in mind, I mean, we're thinking about a number of different things, but what we have in mind is just that coming off the cul-de-sac that would come off and down into this flat area down in here that probably would serve the purpose of parking. There was. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Wallach. So you basically don't know if there are any environmental issues with the property then? Like I'm not aware of any. Or anything like that. I'm so uh, if you end up developing developing it, then you go, are you going to have to test to see if there's any environmental issues and are you willing to make it whole if there are? We are definitely going to be doing a phase one environmental study. In fact, we've already um, commissioned that work, so we'll be doing all of that kind of work to make sure that there's nothing on this. But I'm not aware of anything. I've been babysitting this property since 1976. I don't know what happened before that. It was a train yard at one point. Um, but because, yeah, because I know the, that the old train yard off of uh, Lake Street uh, actually turned out to be a Superfund site because of all the stuff that's there. Right. Uh, the, the railroad, uh, my grandfather bought this from the railroad in 1943. Uh, I can't stand here tonight and tell you what's underground. There's no way I can know that. But uh, as far as I know, there's, there, I, I expect no <laughs> major issues there. Mr. Kuhar? Um, do you recall the old Almanac buildings in that? Are they, were they on this partial at all? Almanac buildings? Well, there was two giant limestone buildings that housed uh, at one time paper products and that. I'm just trying to think in my mind where they would... Well, we, we still have a couple of old uh, uh, the old uh, sandstone buildings down in our property. There are two bays mm -hmm. that were built in about 1865. These are the ones that burnt, and they were this they were north. I'm just trying to think where they were east. I, and I west. think 
if I, I believe you're talking about buildings that were down in this area. More to the west. More, more to the south, Close. actually. This is, this is kind of north in this direction, south in that direction. So there was nothing that would bleach from them. Yeah. We, we are aware of some issues on the southern end of the property. But mm -hmm. the northern end of the property, again, I am not aware of any really functioning industrial operations there um, that would cause any kind of uh, uh, environmental issues. I have to agree. Further questions from council? Is there anybody else from your group, Mr. Myers, who would like to speak? I'll give you the opportunity first. Mr. Boyle. Thank you. Um, my name is Howard Boyle. I live at 1485 River Edge Drive in Kent. And I, um, I'm just here to speak to the um, to speak at the properties. I'll pet you can give those to the clerk. She'll pass them on. Give them to the clerk and she'll pass them on. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, I've been working downtown for 44 years. Yes, 44 years. And, um, and I've been working, I think, with every city manager from Roy Stipe to Dave Reller. And, um, you know, what happens downtown, what has happened downtown isn't a surprise. I mean, it, it's not something that just happened overnight. I know my wife always gets a kick out of the fact that they'll say, you know, the neat thing about downtown Canada is it just happened overnight. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, and, but yeah, if you, right. and I know that you, you know that because you spend all these hours working in these meetings, but, but uh, good planning is something that is not an accident. It, it happens and times change. There are times when um, I understand why the property was, was owned industrial, because it was owned by an industrial company. Uh, however, they never used it that way. Even the railroad only used it just to move into their, to their site. Um, what I, um, I just wanted to let you know that that site primarily has, uh, if it had a building on it, it was a commercial building. And I, I've shown you there some uh, picture. Uh, the last two, two pages, or last three pages, I think, were uh, just, just uh, came about the last few days, and they were in a scrapbook by um, W.W. W. Warner. And uh, they were really a, uh, something we thought, found very interesting. This is Tom's building, if you, um, um, that you can see with the smokestack there. The building off to the right that looks like a, um, a, a small, actually it's a two-story, very nice two-story building was built, uh, we think, by uh, John Brown in, in 1839 as a hotel and store. Uh, now, John Brown is not known to be a hotel operator uh, or, or a, um, a store, store owner. However, he was, he did build quite a few buildings in that area, uh, this being the third building that he built. And um, he left town shortly after that, and the building has, has gone through a lot of different uses. I don't think to, to John's uh, comments, I don't think it was ever used industrially. I think it was, you can tell, it's, it's more of a, a commercial use type building. And, and I don't think that it was used as a hotel very long, frankly. Um, it, just, it just doesn't pop up. Uh, however, more pictures of it are showing, being shown. And it's fascinating because it was a, it was a major structure for Franklin Avenue. And um, so that is really the only use of that property. The, the uh, downtowns develop block by block. And we have a pedestrian level downtown. We need close in blocks to become um, commercial so that it, it drives the people into the commercial district to use the uh, stores and the restaurants and, the, and the, uh, um, all the different places to go. And, it, and you can see it even in our real estate, our, ho our homes, Blocks that are within five blocks of downtown are the hot blocks. That's where people want to live. They want to live there because they can walk downtown. It's, it's very advantageous to live in those areas. So there's a lot of benefits for creating these downtown districts. And this one, this is the first block south of, of downtown, as John indicated, the first one that goes on the other side of Summit Street uh, and properly uh, zoned for development. And, and I'm sure it won't be the last, but it, it, uh, at this point, it is the first. And I, I would just encourage you to continue that type of zoning, the pedestrian zoning, so that we can continue building the downtown so that everybody can be proud of it. Thanks. Thank you. Further from the audience? Mr. Fuller. Um, 
Uh, my name is Doug Fuller. Uh, I live at 1431 River Edge Drive. Um, I am a retired or largely retired architect. Um, been practicing in Kent for over 40 years. Um, I'm telling you that because I owned uh, several properties in the downtown area. I've been a downtown business owner for many, uh, many years and was very involved in the development of the Main Street program. I remember when Dave uh, came to town, I was absolutely delighted uh, when uh, he brought up the idea of starting a Main Street uh, program in the city because we had talked, I had talked and others had talked with Council about, anyway, I'm off subject. Um, I've been involved in the downtown. We've looked at it, we've seen it grow in, in, a, in a manner, in a change in a manner that we just um, perhaps imagined but never really realized it could happen as fast as it did. And now we're, we're seeing people say, you know, we're along the edge of this commercial district and we'd like to join that. Um, and so I'm here in support of this. And I should say, by the way, I have nothing to do with this project. I'm not hired by Tom or anybody else associated with the project. I'm here just because I live in Kent and I've worked here a long time. So, like I said, people on the edges of the downtown now are saying, I want to be in on that. And we have the opportunity to take something from an industrial district into a commercial district and join the downtown in the type of, of commerce and activity and things that we've experienced over the past um, uh, 15 years and the changes that we've had. This is kind of neat that it's come up because it's really one of the few directions that the downtown commercial areas can really expand with any uh, great ease. Uh, in any other direction, you're bumping up against uh, uh, properties that are already developed, a river or uh, other places, and so it, it's nice that this piece of property has come up to do this. So I'm here, I think, to tell you, I think this is a good idea. Uh, it will expand the downtown commercial district. It will take us away from having what could be an industrial uh, property right up next to the commercial uh, as it as commercial might develop up on the was that, the northeast corner of Summit and Franklin, and that area might uh, see redevelopment. And by redevelopment, I don't mean tearing it down, seeing those buildings become something new. So uh, I think this is a good idea. Actually, if you and, and if you look along um, Summit Street on the south side of Summit Street, it is largely uh, commercially used up until you get further east on Summit up towards the university. It, it goes from drugstores uh, to the, the bookstore on the corner, the drugstore, uh, auto parts store, and, and continues along that way. So I think it's a very logical change. I hope you'll consider it, and I think it'll be good for all of us. Thanks. Thank you. Further from the audience? Anyone? My name is Nora Jacobs, 34 Division Street in Hudson. Uh, I'm going to read this if you'll bear with me. I want to thank all of you for allowing me to speak to you tonight. I am chair of the Kent State University Foundation Board of Directors. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the proposed rezoning on 200 West William Street from industrial to commercial. As members of council no doubt know, the Kent State University Foundation is the developer and owner of the Kent State University Hotel and Conference Center located on DePeister Street. When we embarked on that project nearly 10 years ago, we did so not because the foundation wanted to run a hotel. We did it because we believed a first class hotel would be a catalyst to transform downtown Kent and in turn support the university's vision to operate in a community known for its quality of life and vibrancy. I think everyone in this room would agree that we achieved that goal, a goal that we did not reach without a strong partnership with the city of Kent, the merchants who operate in town, and the residents of Kent who are strong supporters of the restaurants and shops now located in Kent's downtown core. In fact, anyone who remembers the old Kent, and I do because I'm also a graduate of the university, will remember how different Kent used to be. 
Kent State was known as a suitcase college because all the students went home for the weekend. There was nothing to keep them here on Saturday and Sunday. Parents arrived with no place to stay and no nice restaurant to take their son and daughter to before they headed home. There were no interesting places, <clears throat> excuse me, for faculty to shop and certainly nothing to draw residents from nearby communities like Hudson, Aurora, or Stowe. The foundation is thrilled to be part of the energy that now exists in downtown Kent. And we commend the city's leadership for the work it has invested to make sure this critical part of the city has the right mix of retail, business, dining, and entertainment. You have thoughtfully planned expansion of the district to make sure it is sustainable, that it is not overbuilt, and that it reflects the local market. We on the foundation board are concerned that expanding the downtown commercial core to the proposed industrial property threatens that sustainability. We believe more commercial space outside the core district will lead to vacancies and threaten the energy that currently exists because thriving businesses are located within walking distance of each other and complement each other right next to each other with the services they offer. We are especially concerned because more redevelopment is about to happen on North Main Water Street. That part of the downtown core will be an important capstone to the district's revitalization. We believe rezoning parts of William Street will threaten the viability of that project, and we would hate to see that happen. On behalf, on behalf of my colleagues on the foundation board, I urge council to vote against the rezoning of this parcel. Your decision is critical to preserving the new downtown Kent, a point of pride for the university, the residents of Kent, and yes, for the Kent State University Hotel and Conference Center. As you reconsider this request, thank you for making the interests of the larger community your priority. Further? Good evening. I'm uh, John Amig. 823 Dominion Drive is my residence in 164 East Main Street. Suite 201 is my office in downtown. So, uh, I am here uh, as a representation in this case for Nipano. It's a property that I've had the opportunity to be involved with uh, in my occupation. I'm a real estate appraiser, uh, specializing in commercial and industrial properties. And uh, my clients include uh, the city of Kent, uh, the Portage County Park District, Kent State, uh, Mr. Uh, Boyle's Bank, and a uh, number of individuals in this room. So I've been around for 43 years, got my education at Kent State, and been here ever since. Um, specifically on this property, and I, I'll, I'll try to be brief and answer questions because I think that may be more helpful than me expounding, uh, you know, what exactly is going on. Um, ideally, you think about the ideal characteristics of an industrial site, and there are two key considerations, um, shape and topography. Uh, if you think of good industrial parks, new modern industrial parks, whether they're in Ravenna, down here on the southwest side of Kent, maybe down in... Uh, Brimfield in the Jed, at the old ball fields, at Malloy and Mogador Road, Streetsboro, Aurora, Twinsburg, Macedonia, they're laid out in a grid. They tend to be fairly level to very gently rolling topography, and they tend to be rectangular sites or uh, uh, sites with, with a, not an irregular shape. Commercial development, on the other hand, can be done on a more uh, difficult site with topography issues. Uh, it was mentioned that our site has topography issues. The specifics on that are 25 feet of grade variation from the highest point on the eastern portion of the site to the lowest point at the southwest corner. 25 feet is significant. Um, when these zoning issues get appealed to a higher level, the key for a real estate appraiser, which I've served as in those hearings, is, is the site, is it po feasibly possible to develop that site for industrial purposes? I don't have enough information, nor was I asked in this case to, to, to answer that question tonight, uh, but it would be very difficult because it's going to take a, a decent amount of money 
to move that earth to level that site to make it possible, uh, physically possible, financially feasible to develop it as an industrial piece. Uh, shape, you can't overcome. The shape is what the shape is. And so the value of the property would be less because it does have the irregular shape and the cost to level the site may make it totally infeasible to develop the property for industrial purposes. Commercial, on the other hand, uh, when I have appraised this larger parcel, which includes 15 acres of land with about 100,000 square feet of industrial buildings uh, that Mr. Myers runs his business out of, I have always said that there's some excess land there. There's about five acres of industrial land on the south end and two to three acres of non-industrial land, commercial land, or mixed use land on the north end of what we're talking about today. So over a, a course of having done appraisals on this property before, I've identified that piece and have never said that it was would be suitable for industrial purposes, but rather uh, for com either commercial or mixed use. That's the synopsis of uh, you know, my view of it from a real estate valuation standpoint. Uh, I think the highest and best use, which is a key term, it's the starting point in the appraisal process for an appraiser, the highest and best use would be for commercial purposes. Questions? Thank you. Anyone else from the audience care to just comment on this matter? Back to council. Comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. It's got this pretty high for me, but <laughs> my name is John Flynn, 1491 River Edge Drive, Kent, Ohio. Uh, as I indicated, uh, I'm here representing Nipano. Um, as most of you know, I'm an attorney in Kent, a uh, longtime property owner in Kent, a uh, longtime business owner in Kent. Uh, what I'd like to say is, you know, the council really has an opportunity right now uh, to do something very, very useful with that land. As it's been indicated, uh, zoned industrial, it's, it's just not suitable as an industrial parcel. Um, you've got an opportunity here to, to really do something very valuable for this town, uh, despite what the representative from Kent State University indicated, uh, and I'm not sure exactly where she was going with it. We shouldn't have commercial property because it might hurt other commercial property. Um, you know, that's foreign to my way of thinking, and uh, certainly not what most cities consider to be a good thing for a downtown. You know, keep it small so nobody else can compete, uh, if that's where she was going. Uh, changing the zoning here, uh, will add jobs. Uh, it will add to the tax base. Uh, as Mr. Fuller indicated, you know, we really can't expand in too many directions. Uh, again, going uh, to, the, to the west, uh, out Main Street, you can't do that uh, because of the stately homes, the Masonic Temple, the residential nature of it. You really can't go north uh, because, of course, Water Street dead ends and then you've got the river. So you really can't expand that direction. Uh, you can't expand the downtown east because you've got Kent State University there. Um, and, and what Doug indicated, too, is something, you know, that I have said. Uh, on the south side of Summit Street, you have already expanded the commercial district. Again, um, and, and then even on the other corners, you've got, you know, the, the uh, dog grooming place. You've got another commercial structure right there. Uh, I think they sell wireless phones. Uh, then you've got the farmer's market that backs up. And then as you go up the, the east side of Summit Street, you've got the Schindler's bookstore there. Um, you've got the drugstore. You have advanced auto parts. Um, in between all that, you've got that apartment complex. Then you go up to the next block. Uh, you've got that physical therapy building. Uh, you've got another commercial building uh, with Jack Cole real estate there. So you've already expanded the downtown to the south. So this just pretty much lines it up. <clears throat> and, and there, you know, again, it can't be used for industrial purposes. It can be used for commercial purposes. And again, that's going to add to the tax base. And, and that really is keeping in line with what is supposed to be the bicentennial um, draft that, that we are to follow. And you're speaking of the bicentennial draft. Um, it increases employment. Uh, connection to a bike trail, uh, increases the tax base, and really a commercial business down there would really 
add to the attractiveness of coming into town off Magador Road and coming up Stowe Street. I don't believe it can possibly hurt the values of the property owners down there, as I understand it. Um, the two homes there next to the post office are rental properties. Uh, then when you consider what the post office is, which is even further south, and you consider that large tract of land, essentially that's a commercial business also. So again, um, you know, you've heard from some people here that are very qualified. Um, you know, speaking of Howard Boyle since he's gone, uh, you know, I've known Howard since I was a kid. There's nobody's done more for this town than Howard Boyle. And some of you probably would forget he was the one who was instrumental in the, in the streetscape program that put up the, the sidewalks, the light posts, buried all the utilities, was instrumental in uh, the Puffer Belly, uh, restoration of the railroad depot, taking up the pavement on Franklin Avenue to make it a brick street. All those were done by Howard Boyle. And then you've got Doug Fuller, who's done his own development downtown. Um, John Emig, you've heard from, and there's nobody in this community, it, probably in northeastern Ohio, who's done more commercial and industrial appraisals than John Emig. And if you want to include me as a business owner, not only am I representing this individual, but again, I've been here my whole life. You, and, you know that I've had property downtown for the last 40 years, a business in town for 45 years, and you folks entrusted me with the beautiful post office uh, that, that was a courthouse that now has been fully restored with a provision in it that I said to the city council, it can't be torn down without the permission of, of the city of Kent and the property owner. So I don't think there's anybody that cares more about this downtown than the four individuals and Tom Myers who have spoken here. This should be a commercial piece of property it's going to add to the city, and it's going to be something that this city will be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Schaefer? I have a question. For Mr. Flynn? Um, I think it's... I think there's more. Oh, there's more people? I want, oh. I want to oh, ask Bridget one, but that's okay if there's other people that need to speak to it, so I'll ask. I'll, Go I'll defer. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. My name's Gary Brailer. I live at uh, 320. Glen Park Drive in Bay Village, Ohio. Yeah, I just wanted to make clear uh, a couple things that were said. Firstly, the, the, the university does not own, <laughs> we're speaking on behalf as one alumni and two, the foundation. Uh, the foundation is a separate entity from the university. We are entrusted and in fact, we have our diligence in our, uh, you know, our whole existence is to be stewards of donors' money. And as Nora pointed out, we, uh, we did not set out in this endeavor, <laughs> but we felt it was vital when Dave Ruler came in and, and President Lefton and the City Council that uh, we needed to revitalize downtown. There wasn't, you know, I, I know a lot of people have been here and have businesses, but there wasn't a lot going on until that point. And it was incumbent on us that if for us not investing in this property, there would not be a revitalized downtown. Now. Whether that's true or not, I can't answer. I just know that that's how it was presented to us. So we have an obligation to our donors. This is an investment. We are not, by any stretch of the imagination, trying to uh, tamper uh, competitive businesses, okay? I'm in business, I've been many developments. I, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with you, but businesses in small and large cities in Ohio and, and, and elsewhere across the country so I do, I am familiar with it. Uh, that's why we took the risk. A lot of the risk that we took, we understood that we were doing this for non-financial reasons or this would not have been built. We were doing this for the town so that we would have a vibrant community that would support the university and then the university supports the downtown. We have a virtuous cycle. Now, we also know that demographics are changing on students. We don't have as large a population of students coming in to higher education. So Kent and Kent State have to work like this to get a larger share of those students. We are confident and committed that if it's not for a vibrant downtown, we won't get a larger share of those students. Yes, we have pedagogy. Yes, we have a high class or, uh, uh, university with phenomenal teaching and faculty, but we need a vibrant downtown. 
as far as the competitiveness involved in, uh, you can look at cities across Ohio, not too far north you can compete with them. When you expand, it's not that we're against expansion. It's certainly not against expansion of commercial property. What we're against is expand, it's the rate of expansion that matters. It's the rate of growth. Not the fact that you're growing or not growing, it's the rate of the growth. We need to have a densely populated, vibrant downtown and then begin to expand outward. You can see it across the country. When you expand too fast, too quickly, you have dead zones in between. Things start to uh, you know, deteriorate. You get higher vacancies. You get lower rates of demand. You get lower rates for your hotel rooms, et cetera. I mean, this is, a, this is again, is a virtuous cycle. So we're not against competition. What we're against is we have, a, we have a gem right here. We need to monitor how we expand it, that we don't just rush and expand it and we have zones north and south, and then we start pulling from the core. So that's our concern. Our concern is not, we, we are, uh, we've always been big admirers of Dave Ruler and city council, and I, we know many of you, and in fact, many of you may have money in the foundation that we're <laughs> charged with. But, you know, we do have a financial obligation to our donors. So this is critical that, uh, you know, we do, we will have to do what's necessary. We feel we have a gem here in the downtown and that, uh, you know, if you expand, uh, you know, you can talk to Robert Moses in New York City and, you know, read, if you haven't read it, read Carol's book on it. He, he was one of the first to say the expansion without dedicated resources <coughs> and dedicated population growth and done at a, at a pace that makes sense will destroy a city. So, you know, read the book. But um, we're not here to discourage competition. We love what's happening in Kent. We love the support that we've had. We love the support that we've had from the city. Um, we just want to make sure we maintain it, uh, that people continue to call us. I get unwarranted calls all the time saying how beautiful it is, people watering the plants. It's because there's a core and there's a dense core, and it's not spread across. Uh, too far in area. So I think I've made my point. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Anyone else in the audience? Sure. <coughs> Evening. Hi. Hi, my name is Amy Zenner, 545 Franklin Avenue, Kent. I'm the homeowner there, and uh, I've really appreciated, um, you know, I've, li I've been a 40-year resident. I've appreciated the growth in the downtown area, um, the way it's been, you, you know, carefully planned and monitored by the city manager, the mayor, and the council. Really appreciate all that. My granddaughter, who lives with me, and I uh, take advantage of a lot of what downtown Kent has to offer. And uh, I'm not entirely opposed to development of this property. I'm just concerned with what might go in there. Besides really enjoying being able to walk downtown and take advantage of the restaurants and the shops, I also enjoy sitting out on the front porch with my granddaughter and watching the sunset. Uh, we sit out there and we watch thunderstorms together and uh, I'm concerned with something going in there. I, I don't want to sit there and look at a building. I really don't. Um, mm. Something go, that goes in there that would be uh, neighborhood friendly, family friendly, I think would be a great idea. But uh, I'm just really asking that council would be vigilant and monitoring what goes in there and not make it de detract from the neighborhood. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience? My name is Ann Courtney Davis. I'm the homeowner at 555 Franklin. Uh, I was born and raised here in Kent, and I was gone for 40 years. I came back two years ago because of what is happening here. It is so exciting. It is just absolutely, there's nothing to equal what's happening in Kent. And I wanted to be a part of it again. So I bought a home back here on Franklin Avenue. Um, I am not opposed to intelligent uh, development. I, but I just have some questions, like they keep talking about referring this to as, as the West Williams Street project, but I don't see anywhere that this 3.91 acres is anywhere near contingent to the West 
Williams. I mean, will they will there be access to that property from West? That will directly affect me because I live right on that corner. Uh, the other issue I have is this. Um, you know, I'm zoned. When I bought the house, the city was very, very adamant that I was going to make that a single family home, which was exactly what I was had in mind and exactly what I did. So, uh, I mean, what's going to happen now? They're going to build uh, lights, uh, uh, lots of noise, all that stuff right across the street from me. I mean, is there going to be any uh, anything for noise and light uh, barrier for us? who are homeowners on the other side of the street? That's just my questions. You know, uh, is there going to be access from Williams? And are there going to be provisions for light and noise? Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Anything further? May I say, uh, just sure. to answer that. Um, you know, the way that, or whatever is going to be built there, and, and what the buffers will be, and the plantings will be, and the setbacks will be, uh, that's all going to go back before the Planning Commission. Um, this really isn't an issue, I think, before the Council, uh, you know, as to how it's to be zoned. I mean, it is how it's to be zoned, but all the protections that are going to be afforded the neighbors are subject to the Planning Commission and their mandates. We're going to put you on payroll for answering that for us, Joe, Mr. Flynn. No, we can't afford him. We can't, we can't afford him. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pano. Um, good evening. My name is Peter Pano. Um, I'm an architect and builder here in Kent. And truth be told, I am working with Mr. Myers on this project. I need your address, too, uh, for the record. Uh, 1258 Windward Lane. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. Um, he is a member of one of our boards and is yes. not permitted to advocate in front of other boards. Oh. So he, he cannot speak. Wait, wait. You cannot speak. If, if you speak, you'll, you... But I was told I could tonight. Why? She's the law director. No. As a citizen. You just you just indicated you should you, of Kent. you you just indicated that truth be told, you work for right. the property of you you are about to advocate. I would not do that, Mr. Pano. Right. Peter, okay, I'll sit down. Thank you. Nice try. Anyone else from the audience? Back to council, Ms. Schaefer. I would like to ask um, Bridget a question. Sure. So, Bridget, even though we're not talking about usage, if something should be built on that site, would there necessarily be added sidewalks on that area that doesn't have sidewalks and all, all the, the and maybe street up improvements and things like that that would be part and parcel of any particular development, whatever it is? All the requirements, if we were to, that are applicable to the commercial downtown district would apply, but those are contingent upon whether it's a permitted or conditionally permitted use. So it would be difficult to articulate all the requirements that would be associated with that. I can tell you, though, that <coughs> typically when there is disturbances to a site, they are responsible for uh, addressing the sidewalk and things along that. But again, without knowing the use and access, ingress, egress, I couldn't tell you specifically what would be encompassed in the site plan review or consideration. Okay, just to follow up on that, but say if that traffic, that intersection on Franklin and Summit had to be improved because of the increased traffic or safety issues, would that be incumbent upon the city? Would that be on the city's dime? It would be the developer's responsibility. Thank you. Mr. Anything further? No. Mr. Kuar? Is it too early for a motion? Uh, not if you'd like one. I'd like to make a motion to approve the zoning change. Is there a second? I'll second. Oh, oh. Oh, you want to put that with, with the... With, with the, the uh, provisions with just the, as put okay. down. For the, okay. For the conditionally permitted parking plan. And the emergency clause. And the emergency clause. And the emergency clause. You agree to that? Okay. Let me go back to the okay. comments from the maker of the motion. You know, for 70 plus years, 
I grew up in that neighborhood where that piece of property was. Other than an occasional uh, compressor rolling down a railroad track and bumping off a piece of rubber, uh, bums sleeping on the hill and doing what they do and trash, uh, we actually tried to dig a swimming pool on that property as kids. There's been plenty of opportunity for commercial buildings to be put up. And I don't think I'd want to look at a steel building if I was on the other side of the street. I had even looked at that property once myself, and it was way beyond my financial means to develop it. So here this piece of property sat in the south end of Kent for 70 years, and nobody wanted to do anything constructive with it. And I couldn't think of anything better to see something vibrant and new in that neighborhood because I know it will spur the, the houses around it to improve and also the development of the downtown Kent to move. And then the next thing you're going to see is the old RB&W property and, and other things moving in. Uh, I think it's a tremendous opportunity for the city, and uh, I'm for 200% if you could get that far. Any further from you, Mrs. Roseburg? Uh, just that I'm, I'm not at the... It was the decision made by our uh, planning commission, and it was a unanimous vote. I'm not inclined to go against um, their recommendation. Um, I think that it will <coughs> increase the, the potential value for that property to, to, to further economic development in a way that I don't necessarily believe will threaten uh, existing businesses. I think it's, it's a net gain. It's a positive. So that's why I support it. Ms. Schaefer? Yeah, I am going to support it as well. Um, uh, with the caveat that uh, I will fight to make this the best project, whatever it will be, for the neighborhood and for the Central Business District because I believe in um, working together with the university. I also believe that if uh, we um, start blocking development, that would be unprecedented for what we've been doing over the last 10 years. You know. I don't want to leave it as industrial because even though it was explained that it may not be the best use <coughs> industrial, if it can't be anything else, it might just well become industrial, which would not be a good thing for the neighborhood or the, for the downtown. I mean, if somebody wants to put up storage units or something like that, um, the property owners have the right to do with that property what is allowed in in the zoning code and I appreciate that um, they've come to have a zoning change from industrial um, I don't believe this is a town versus gown issue I think that we just um, work hard to uh, continue to improve the downtown shoulder to shoulder and um, fight to make this a, a whatever it is a great project Swalk. Yeah, I would like to see it become a commercial district also, but I think at this point in time, I do not want to see it become commercial, maybe in a couple of years. But right now, I would like to focus most of our attention on the mill district and work on that, get that developed and up and running first. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say no. 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 Two, Two no's. no's. Motion passes. And that will adjourn the land use committee. Thank Community you. Community development, Mr. Kuhar. Okay. So are we bypassing number one now? Or is that uh, why are we bypassing number one or what? No, we're Do good. We, number good. two in land use was pulled. God. Pardon me. Number two in land use was pulled. What are you talking about? Okay, so, so we're do, are we starting with number one, the 200 West William Street zoning? Then we no. just do we're that. We're in community we're development. We're in community development. Right. Special event permit. Right. Wrong paper now. He must not have remembered. He's got it. Your first one, special events, John. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I see it. Who's who's doing this? You. Your committee. 
I mean, who is going to speak on it? We got it, John. So this is the. Um, you want to, let's give it five minutes. Let's let's give it a couple minutes so we can clear the room if people want to leave. Thank you. We'll see you. Oh, huh? yeah. Oh, they they change your order. I haven't been here. Yeah. Come on, man. You can call me John. Yes. I'm not suggesting just keep in mind they still have to vote for it in two weeks. So, but after that, you're yeah. Yeah, we can help. Sure, talk to whoever you want. Yeah. No, you're doing, my friend. If you remember, if you talk to more, just got back from Columbus. Four. At one time. No, even in succession. Then it's a, it's a, it's a big meeting. That's all. It's just a meeting. Yeah. It's just, it's sunshine. Are we ready to roll? If you have questions, call me. I'll explain it to you. I think so. Roll out. Come on. Here. <laughs> right. John, I think we can go. We ready? We are. <coughs> yeah. May we have your undivided attention. We're going to continue the community <laughs> development portion with yes. the uh, permit for the Kent Torch Fest. Well, they're there. They don't need an introduction. You know them. And I think we've mentioned the, the river celebration, the 50 years of the Burning River, and We've gone from 43 impairments to seven, I think, in the last whatever couple decades. So, and you can even eat the fish in the in the river, according to the uh, health experts now. Experts now, so it's all good news. And uh, these guys want to throw a party, <coughs> and to throw that party, they need some additional uh, area. They're asking your permission to block off uh, the bridge, I think. So, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, this is this is part of actually a four-day celebration, and it, it kicks off in Kent. Um, it basically is going to uh, start with our festival. We're calling it the Kent Torch Fest. Um, the next day, it will move on to Cuyahoga Falls uh, with a, a small ceremony, um, then to uh, Cascade Valley, uh, Metro Parks, uh, the National Park Service, uh, Station Road Park. Um, the next day, it uh, culminates in downtown Cleveland uh, as part of the Blazing Paddles uh, uh, event there. So this, this is really a, a celebration of food and music and, and, and to uh, celebrate uh, not only the history of, of the Burning River, the 50th anniversary of that, but also to uh, highlight some of the activities that have uh, been achieved in Kent also. As part of that, um, hometown bank has stepped up and is providing entertainment we're going to have alex bevan hopefully on the, a stage on the on the bridge and that's going to be followed by uh the chardon polka uh, band at the hometown plaza um, in addition to that uh, we hope to have the designation through ohio department of natural resources of the cuyahoga river water trail um, and then the last piece is a piece of artwork that we're going to uh, um, unveil, um, and we're uh, applying for funding for that uh, uh, through the Portage Foundation and through some other groups. So hopefully uh, uh, we'll have a bronze tablet that will, this is kind of the uh, um, wax cast of it. It will, um, it actually, uh, created by George Danhires, who, if you know George, he's uh, a nationally renowned sculptor. Uh, he did the stuff at the uh, uh, parking garage and then also the uh, bicentennial sculpture. And this basically is a relief tablet, and the center section is actually pulled out with a clean river and shows fish and turtles and, and a pristine river. And on the outside is the river of the past. It shows the industrial uh, uses of the river and the burning uh, of the river. And so it, it's kind of a, a neat uh, symbol to, to show how the river has come back in Kent. It'll have an inscription on it uh, from the Wick Poetry S Center that was actually created by a fourth grader in Kent, um, uh, a three-line river stanza that'll be engraved into the plaque also. Um, so 
that's kind of the festival. We're looking, uh, like I said, to have the permit approved to be able to shut down uh, the bridge uh, that day from uh, from four to ten. Closure from 10 a.m. to 10. Questions? Any questions? Harrison, uh, you want to add anything? Uh, we've been working closely with the city manager's office on. I think it's very exciting. I think it's really, uh, I think it's cool stuff celebrating a uh, healthy river. The fact that you could, that anyone suggests you eat a fish out of the river is amazing. Uh, <laughs> and it should be celebrated. My, only, qu too, my only question, just in, just out of curiosity, how was the, the fourth graders stanza selected? selected. Was, was there a contest um, or? It was um, actually, it was a project from Wick Poetry Center Last summer, they, they went to Ken Parks and Rec camps. They went to Holden School, Wall School, and they collected a number of them. They narrowed it down to four or five, and then we had a small committee and really relied on, on the artist, the one that kind of spoke to him. And this is something in conjunction with some grant monies at the Wick Poetry Center. Are we participating the, uh, with? The, the River Stanzas is part of the, uh, the Wick Poetry Center grant. This is separate from that, the production this of, is of the artwork. Okay, but the torch fest on a bridge is. Yeah, the, the agreement that you previously approved uh, a couple of weeks ago with Jim and Dave Hassler, that was something separate. The river stanzas, those are installations that are going to go up, uh, but it's also the same theme uh, and around the same time. So two different things, but they both can uh, uh, compound on each other. And Great. Benefit. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Council? Anybody from the audience? Authorized with emergency. Second. <laughs> I think it's a great, another great thing, and great to celebrate the city and the river and the environment and everything that's Kent. So it's, it's going to be super time. We're, ru we're running out of weekends in Kent for festivals. I, that's I, a good, it's a good problem to have. I really appreciate being in the lineup and There's being the first in the lineup. I think that that says a lot for our community. Sure. And, you know, I think that this is an awesome festival to celebrate the environmental heritage of the river and its restoration. There is also, I, I didn't mm -hmm. neglect to say that, there is a, to a torch itself, and it's actually going to come <laughs> down the river and, and uh, stop at Heritage Park. And uh, the, Elaine Marsh, I don't know if you know Elaine, but she's been a big... We're in a motion. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> speak to the motion or don't speak at all. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All in favor of motion? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Roger. Stop. Right. Stop. Yep. Roger. Yeah, I just want to clarify. Yeah, we've had two different pieces of communication. Is this on the 22nd or the 20th? It's on the 20th. It is on the 20th. Thursday? Right. Yes. yes, Thursday night. Okay. Uh, we on the, uh, on the manager's communication says the yep. 22nd, so I just want right. to clarify. It is on, the, no, it no, is on Thursday the 20th. 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 i got to put it back in my calendar book. <laughs> Now, we got one more. Motion. On the motion. Yeah, I'm going to support the motion because I think it's great that we have something happening in June in Kent. Yep. <laughs> Jack? Yeah, I'm going to support the motion and thank you for bringing Alex, Alex Bevan back. I haven't seen him since I was at Kent State University. So. <laughs> that was a long His time hometown. ago. Yep. Any more? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Nice job. Yeah, I know. Alex. Okay. Okay. Next closure. Wizardly World of Kent. Yes. So this is uh, Heather's annual costume party in downtown <laughs> Kent. Um, it's witch related, and of course it had its origins with Harry Potter, but it's no longer using that name. It's the Wizardly World of Kent, and uh, it's a victim of its own success, meaning they want to. They got more stuff they want to do than they have space to do it in. So uh, I think they want to. They're here tonight to request an adjustment in the street closure. Correct? You want to, uh, either one of you want to offer specifics on that? Oh, sorry. She's ready. Oh, Tracy's ready to blab. So yeah. me or her? What do you got? Me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, we ask this every time somebody comes up. Could we please expand the the street down to Brady to include Bent Tree? Because Bent Tree always is really upset that they get left out of all these events, because the the 
you know, the borders go up at Portage and then poor bent trees down there all by itself and they have butterbeer and everything else. So can we just extend the closures down to Brady, please? Sure. Okay. Um, great question. And of course that comes up all the time. So last year's Wizardly World, um, I th we expanded quite a bit. We used some space that was kind of unconventional and didn't go that well. Woodsy's parking lot wasn't the best for our vendors. We surveyed our businesses and our vendors after the event. We also, of course, get feedback from the community business owners that um, that are feeling strongly and for one reason or another. Um, and so the the discussion at the committee level has been okay, especially you know the exclude or yeah, the the perceived exclusion of scribbles. So we put them on the on 10,000 flyers and put them on the event page and everything and people still see the road closed sign and don't care to, to walk by it to go see the things that are outside of the actual footprint of the event. So we originally talked about closing it all the way to Brady and then we as uh, people that live in town as we drive through town we're thinking my god this is so much real estate like we don't have and we don't want to have that much more stuff in the streets. We're trying to find the right, we're trying to right size this, we're trying to balance it so we're not hurting the businesses. That's number one is that this is good for the businesses, it's good for the community, um, it brings visitors and it maybe even makes us some money. So, um, so that was our first thought was to go to Brady to get those two businesses specifically, um, Scribbles and Bent Tree included. And then um, so we're trying to do a little bit less vendors this year because there was too much of certain categories and a little bit less of the food because there wasn't, the lines weren't as crazy outside of the businesses. So we're, again, we're trying to, trying to make this work for everybody. Um, so, uh, so then we kind of went back to maybe we just go to Portage and um, actually I've talked to Mike, um, one of the owners at Bentry and that's something new we're trying to do is offer the businesses that are a little bit outside of the footprint to come be a part of of the mayhem just set up in the middle of the mess and come make a bunch of money there so to talk to Gwen at Pop to talk to Tom at Bellaria come sling slices of pizza I would much rather have them going crazy running two businesses during the day than having somebody from the outside come in and capitalize on on what we're trying to do for our downtown so um, I think we, we were there and then I think we kind of scaled back and then, um, like I said, I talked to Ben Tree and, and he was like, oh, that's actually a pretty good idea. Like, then we're not, then we're not totally left out. And he said, and, and I said, you should come to council. It's always so much fun. And he's like, well, I, I really can't make it. And uh, he said, but you know, if, if it made sense, if there was cool stuff happening in the street all the way up to me, that'd be great. And we'd love to have the road close to there, but we don't want a no man's land. And, um, and we don't, that's the last thing I want to do is have roads closed and have people go, why are the, why are the roads closed? I mean, there's nothing even happening there. And then people are tipped off because they can't get through for traffic purposes and, okay. and all of that. So that's so. all I was concerned about, that they were included. So now they're going to have a booth down in the main part where they could. He's, yeah, he was okay. hoping to, to talk to his business partner. And I said, just set up outside of Hometown Bank Plaza where the entertainment is all yeah. day yeah, and just peddle your good. stuff. Just keep them in mind. And, yeah. and that was great that you went up and talked to them and yeah. got them included. And they were like, bank, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so good. Yeah. So now, Heather, are you officially going to start this topic and you're going to speak about it? <laughs> yeah, so um, so basically what we're asking for this year is to, um, instead of stopping at Columbus Street on North Water, to move um, all of the way down to Portage, Portage um, and, and then having the <coughs> signage clear at Brady saying road closed ahead because I know that that will allow cars to come in and then you have the one way <coughs> coming down the wrong way and mm -hmm. there could be some uh, some mess in that way, like for art and wine, the the bridge is closed so people can come to the bridge, but they can't get in to where we are, so they end up having to turn around. Um, but I didn't hear any real explicit concern about that. I mean, because if you do the road closed ahead, then people just kind of work it out. Um, so we feel like this is the best um, minor expansion and, and adjustment to, to try to make this the best it can be. So every year, we're just, I mean, that's the only way we learn is we do it and then somebody gets upset or has a great idea and then we implement things that make sense to try to, to try to make it better, so. 
and I'm not allowed to speak, but I would wonder if someone would ask you if you were aware that there's a demolition project going on on the corner of Portage. Fenced off. It's fenced off. They already took the bottom back of the building down. Right. My goodness, can't leave town for a minute. Any other <laughs> questions? Anybody else? Council? Move to approve. Wait. Second. With emergency? Can we audience? Oh, sorry. Audience? Oh. oh wait, that's not your job either. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Passes. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Heather. Yeah. Oh, my glasses fell apart. So I'll, I'll, I got it, John. We got uh, another one of these. So uh, it's another street closure. We are party central, obviously, and uh, that's good news for hopefully our downtown businesses. And uh, I will say this, uh, we do, I think we get a little better at it every year. Like Heather said, you know, you learn a little something with each event. So um, this is a new event. It came to us a little late, so it's not everything they wanted it to do, but they were able to kind of come back and f go back and forth, mostly with Harrison and, and Jim to kind of work out some details. This is a Kent State alumni event um, that I think is – Sounds like it's going to be featured around the graduation time, something like that. Is that week? Uh, so you go ahead and provide the details. You've been the point. So, so the the event's called uh, Flashes Forever, or I think it might be listed in there, Forever Flashes. But either way, it's uh, planned for Wednesday, May 8th, from 6 to 8, and the road closures would be from 4 to 10. Uh, so it's a weekday, and that's the week, right? Yeah, Wednesday. That's the uh, end of the semester around that time so the uh, KSU Office of Alumni Relations or the Division of Institutional Advancement they came and applied for this special event permit they're working with the Alumni Association to hold an event at Hometown Bank Plaza and they've done it in past years but just on the plaza so this year they want to actually close North Water Street from Maine to south of Columbus Street I don't think it's going to continue all the way up to Columbus but that's the mark that we put it as. Uh, so they wanted to have some activities on the road, some food, and live music uh, in Hometown Bank Plaza. So they just wanted to have a bigger area for their alumni to enjoy themselves and celebrate graduation and their next uh, transition into being alumni. Uh, yeah. Okay. Questions from uh, Heidi? Yeah. Will you have some kind of transportation from the university to downtown, or does it matter? Since it's for alumni, they would just come straight to downtown bypassing the university. I mean, there's an event earlier in the year that has Lolly the trolley. That's why I'm well, thinking. It's, it's not <laughs> technically for alumni to come back. It's more for students graduating. Do you want Nick to answer? He says he's got an answer. Yeah. I'd like oh, okay. to hear well, more yeah. about who it's for. <laughs> <laughs> Give your name and your position, please. Uh, Nick Gatozzi, uh, Executive Director for Government and Community Relations at Kent State. Uh, so this is an event that was held previously on campus, um, but what they found was that students weren't participating in it because they, and these are, to your question, uh, Councilwoman, um, these are students who are graduating this semester. So it's focused at uh, students who are seniors and finish their finals and are going to be coming downtown anyway. Um, so they, so they, they're making their way downtown. Uh, therefore, um, because of the type of event that it was, uh, I don't know, I, I didn't hear the councilman's uh, comments, but um, I'm sure they were funny. Um, they, so, OK, thank you. Um, so students weren't participating in it because they were going downtown because of the other activities that they could be doing downtown. So this is a, a short period of time uh, where students are going to be, um, and it's designed so that we're bringing in food trucks. Uh, some of the food trucks will be local, um, uh, local uh, companies, local food trucks, local companies, uh, caterers, and and then it'll break up. Um, but it, the event is expanded, uh, and so we we saw it as an opportunity to get students uh, recent. Uh, you know, about to graduate students uh, downtown, uh, and then uh, and then they can go off and, and spend the rest of the the evening doing what they would normally do um, in the downtown area. Uh, so, so it's students that have just graduated, 
Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the, the focus of the event, because they are. Has, is the same day of commencement or? No, no, no. Okay. but, but it, it's basically students are done with finals. You know, they're seniors. They're going to go celebrate. Got and it. so okay. it, it so is. Mom and dad aren't coming. Mom and dad aren't <laughs> coming to this event. Okay, got it. And right. so this That's is an opportunity so. to, you know, for them to have their first yeah. alumni experience, which would, you know, as as the alumni association is is, is envisioning it, it'd be their first alumni experience uh, for a very short period of time, where we would provide them with some resources and. It sounds like fun. Yes. Got it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Irene. Basically, I was going to ask about the purpose is sort of to hook them into the alumni sense of being an alum an alum and you know so that they can then have a fond memory of their university. yes and they can also get some food in their stomachs before they uh imbibe in other activities and alcohol, right? and i'm sorry and alcohol I keep waiting for these questions roger you're what next question? what's that you're next. I'm oh, waiting. I'm next. Well, I'm, I'm just curious, is, Roger. is the executive director going to join those students down there in the, in, in the uh, center? Possibly the in a supervisory capacity, <laughs> but uh, not an engagement. No. Okay. Yeah, right. Not engaged, right. Remain calm. Might as well. Go ahead. Are, are we invited? Is the towns are the townspeople Public invited? Street, are are we invited? Do they want us there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think the students want us there. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how they're doing. You know, I know that there's uh, that there are going to be food trucks, as I think the application describes. I don't know if they're they're banding it. You know, and uh, and then if uh, if somebody shows up that, that better be a yeah. is not be is not banded for food in particular would. Um, uh, if they would be able to pay. I'm not sure how those logistics are. If um, We can always come back and, and report back to council on that if that's what you're looking for. Uh, yeah, I would recommend that you have some strategy for dealing with people that think it's yet another Kent festival. Question, question. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Oh, man. Who? All right. Mm -hmm. Hand up. Mayor. You're going to sell beer on there, so you got the liquor license? Uh, I believe. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, oh, I know. So that's why I got married. Go ahead. That's right. <laughs> the representative for the application who submitted it, they are pursuing a liquor license right now with the Division of Liquor Control. They're doing it solely in Hometown Bank Plaza. All right. So they're not planning to have anything on North Water Street, and they're going to be required to have buffers or a barrier between the Hometown Bank Plaza and the street. So there's going to be a point of entry into the plaza. I got it. Anybody else? Anybody from the audience? Back to council. And I would assume since it's almost tomorrow, you want the emergency clause? Yeah. Move to approve with Second. emergency. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. This time. Okay. Haymakers Farmers Market Sublease yeah, this, Renewal. This, this ought to be a complicated one. No, it's it's easy. You do it every year, um, and it basically allows the haymakers market to sort of ride on. It's a sublease. They ride on our lease with the railroad, and uh, Bridget charges a whopping one dollar for that, but it pays for itself many times over with the reputation of the market, the amenity it provides in the community. Um, and it's a well-known people from outside the community, so it is another destination. So that, that's the pitch. Yep, it's the same <coughs> as every year, as Dave said. It starts the first Saturday in May and extends to the last Saturday in October. And I would seek approval with emergency so I can execute the uh, lease agreement this year. Questions? I have a question. Tracy? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, another councilman asked me, that property over there across the street that we just approved commercial usage of is used for parking for a farmer's market. What happens when that goes away? Well, it is basically they're allowing it. It is their private property right now. So uh, other parking will have, to, they'll have to, other people, they'll have to find a park somewhere else, unfortunately. But that is, Mr. Myers has been gracious to allow that parking there. But he's really under no obligation to do that. So. You can buy that property. Do we have a hand up, Roger, for a question? Hand up. Okay. Well, 
All, uh, anybody from the audience? Back to council. Move to authorize with the emergency. Thank All you. All in favor of motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. So the, uh, the next item uh, is the Celebrate Kent Awards. And um, this is actually, you don't technically approve it. You, you allocate the funding. And it's like our social service funding, where you allocate a designated amount in the budget, and then we distribute it. But we're in the habit, we want to be in the habit of keeping you informed about what, what's, where the money's going to. Um, but as Tom said, you know, at some point we probably, it, it literally is like the same agencies and same uses every year. So we might just in the future send you an email or something. But before we did that, we didn't want you to think we were trying to be sneaky or something. So Tom will run down the list, uh, but it really is the same projects every year that apply, uh, the same agencies and, and projects. Yeah, just real quick, um, the RFP was sent out to all previous recipients as well as uh, advertised in the record courier. So other agencies did have, have a chance to apply. Um, they're good stewards of your money. They take that 15000 and turn it into 90000 with matching funds and do a great job of bringing people into your downtown. And as Bridget will attest, I have to go over every receipt very carefully and uh, make sure that they're using it for the right purposes. Questions? Anybody from the audience? Back to council? Again, no, no action with necessary. With emergency? Or no, we're no, not just for information. Right. And just forget like I, I said all that. In the future, you may just see emails. We just want to make sure you understood that. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Uh, neighborhood project, purpose and need statement. Mm. Yes, so uh, Jim's here, and I see Mike Bruder behind him, and um, they, and I think Calvin's been a part of the meetings. I don't know if Nick's been going, but I, certainly he's aware of them. I think we've tried to keep you informed that uh, there's a small group of residents over in that East Main Street corridor around the Starbucks and across from campus. Um, and we've been using a consultant to help evaluate opportunities to meet the desires of the residents and where those desires can cross with the city's desires and where those cross with Kent State's desires. So it's one of those collaborative shared partnership things that we've gotten pretty good at. And one of the early steps in that, although it's not early really, uh, Jim's been doing a lot of hours and, and meetings and work already, but, but this process is sort of rooted in that, um, what's the due north? and What are they trying to achieve? And what do they want to keep their eyes on? And that kind of gets summarized in a nice clean purpose and needs statement. And uh, it's, it's a bit administrative, procedural perhaps, but Jim has found, and certainly he's got the projects that have had great success from Crane Avenue, Summit Street. Uh, I feel like the parking deck even might have done this, but uh, we routinely now use that purpose and needs as, as I say, sort of that due north in case as the consultant work continues and as Jim gets ideas and the city manager throws other ideas at Jim, uh, he can say, no, that's not due north or that is due north. It sort of becomes that touchstone uh, for the project moving ahead because this is a real project. I mean, I don't want you to uh, um, think this is just for uh, citizen responsiveness. This is a genuine project that is going to continue. Uh, you saw Michael with his video. Uh, he came in and, and the ideas are starting to coagulate, so to speak, and this is the time to make sure we're rooted in a particular value statement and that's that purpose and need. So it's sorry for the preamble and I see Jim is like tapping his foot over there. Like, it's okay. So go ahead. I guess I'll just add how this purpose need was created. Um, it, it was created first, there were several easily identifiable concerns. The worst crash corridor and summit in Portage County <coughs> is East Main Street. Um, you know, the need to make uh, resilient, improved neighborhoods to the north of East Main Street and the need to incorporate Kent State University's master plan to the south of East Main Street, so all sort of collected in this area. Those were the three easy things. Um, but then we had several meetings with a citizens advisory committee. We had some group activities to help come up with what are the needs that these people see in this, this corridor. Uh, we then pulled all that together, drafted a document. We gave it to, the, to all the stakeholders, Kent State and others, as well as the citizens advisory committee. 
Uh, they had time to review it, then they came back. We had another meeting just to talk about it and what comments we had, and then we revised it, and that's what you saw in your packet here. So, and as Dave says, the real important part in this step is it's the guiding document. As we look at all these alternates, we're going to weigh whether they're going to be successful or not based on what's in that document. So your approval is key to make sure that we're going in the right direction that council wants to see us go in. And as Dave, and lastly, as Dave said, you know, we are looking and at later this year to submit for grant funding to move this project forward into design and construction. So it has very real potential moving forward. So uh, lastly, some of the key points in the documents. Uh, that is, uh, first, it's to improve safety and aesthetics as a function of safety. Uh, balance the vehicular congestion and with other modes of transportation, bikes, peds, transit, because those are all in that corridor. It, it makes sure it enhances the adjacent neighborhoods to the north, it integrates with the master plan to the south, and provides in the end reasonable access to all the adjoining properties, whether it's on campus, a side street, or a business to the north. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> anything on this do you if you would approve it I would appreciate it doesn't need to be a resolution Maybe. yeah I would I would approve the purpose and needs I think especially I really appreciate the goal of returning it to a athletic aesthetically aesthetically pleasing stately less cluttered stress-free street that meets the current demands and these pictures are amazing what a contrast so I move to uh, I move to approve the purpose and need statement. I'll second that. Do you need a emergency on that? Okay. Okay. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Oh, discussion? Again? Sure. <laughs> all Thanks. in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Thank you. Passes. He did. He that did. concludes the uh, community <laughs> development. You're back. Right answer me, Mr. Delion. Oh, wait, John, can I ask you something before you get started? I'm, I'm getting started. Wait. You know, the Try not to be too critical. I just got out of the park. Oh, my God. Good <laughs> 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 night. Have fun. You missed the uh, great. What's your deadline? Don't get a ticket. Okay, we'll go with John now. Uh, real qu real quickly here, um, this we're asking for permission to renew the lease at the for the canoe livery operations at John Brown Tannery Park. It's for um, a five-year period with a five-year renewal, and we're also asking to waive the uh, public bidding provision. Crazy. Yes. How's it doing? Was was it a five-year? Tracy, previous, previous uh, the first year was the chairman asked for Tracy. Said Tracy? Oh, and he started I'm sorry. talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, Tracy. How's it doing? It um, last year the uh, it was down a little bit because they didn't have a director, so they basically had this um, a third party kind of running things for them. So the revenues were down quite a bit. They have a new person on board now, and um, it's been profitable every year. This is the first year they had a slight loss, but. Um, very, very excellent safety record, and I think that's the thing that we're most impressed with. It started out with a one-year lease. Um, the next time we uh, mm -hmm. bid it, uh, it was for a three-year, and we only got one bidder. The next time it was for three years, and we only got one bidder. And we feel really <coughs> comfortable with our association with Kent State and all the other programs that we're really working closely with them, uh, other rec programs that we'd like um, to waive that bidding. and. Uh, uh, hopefully stabilize the operations there. This will give them, I think, a little more uh, um, for the business planning perspective to be able to, to bank on having a, a long-term lease. John? Yes. John, John. John. <laughs> uh, so you kind of answered the question I was going to ask, <coughs> is that you want to waive the bidding process along with this approval. And... Uh, this isn't a question, but I, th I think you should keep that in as a formality for questions only. Then. Okay. No. Don't you think that you should keep no, that in <laughs> just so it would have an openness of uh, transparency 
for public actions? Well, I think I think of the law, I, I asked that question of the law director, and she said that that would is a permissible. It is. Um, City councils uh, are permitted to waive competitive biddings for for any reason that they feel is is uh, necessary and honorable. And I think that with the fact that uh, we've had a long-term relationship with Kent State, um, they're the only ones that have bid in the past. I think that is 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 an extremely uh, fair reason to waive competitive bidding because we we just want to continue this this great uh, relationship that we have with them down there at that livery. So so you feel that if uh, we get an email repercussions from it, you'll handle. I will. Yes, sir. Uh, you know what? Typically, I'm I'm most worried about the auditor, and once the auditor sees that 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 the that, that uh, council has officially waived competitive bidding. And there's a good reason in there. I don't have a problem with that at all. Jerry, yeah. uh, does this this doesn't affect the other kayak thing that goes? Other back other operators are, are allowed to come in to actually the tannery. They a lot of them actually go down to Kramer Field and That's put in meant. there. So we can't prohibit another livery operator from dropping off, dropping off, putting in the river there. It doesn't restrict them. What it restricts is setting up your trailer, setting up your base of operations and taking money and exchanging that and actually operating a concession on the on the city <coughs> property. Okay. Roger? Yeah, and uh, Hope, would it make sense if we actually have two motions on this? One, so we officially, uh, so it doesn't blur that we're accepting a contract and waiving. Maybe it makes sense. I, I don't know. I'm just thinking from a legal standpoint and from a Make it real clear that. Uh, well, it will be it will be in the ordinance oh, that okay. that that council is waiving competitive bidding. Oh, so a statement is adequate. Yes. You really don't need to yep. take any action. Mm -hmm. That's all I need. Thank you. <laughs> I forget. Does does the park do the parks get a cut of that somehow? A percent? Yes. So, um, and I think it's on there. We got a, we, we average last year. I think we got like thirty five hundred dollars. Um, it, it's. Ranged anywhere from th thirty-five hundred to five thousand, I think, was the highest. Hmm. The we provide electric service and porta pot there, and you know, clean up garbage and stuff. Further questions? Do you have any questions over there? <laughs> <laughs> Since you're the audience, <laughs> back to Just council. Back there, Do you need the emergency with us? Move yes, to approve please. with emergency. Second. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 No. No? One no? Yeah. yeah, I had discussion, but you moved too quick. Well, it wasn't a question, was it? Uh, no, no, discussion. I'm all for the livery, but, you know, how do, how do I know tonight that someone is interested in livery from an outside party and will never have the opportunity to, to make that choice? And, 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 you know, there's only one every year. That's great, but... You know, when we, when we eliminate the bidding, we've eliminated any opportunity from somebody else doing that. And right now, maybe we're not growing, you know, in the visual eye of people, but as, as the city grows more, there'll be more people trying to take opportunities that are in front of them. So that's the only reason I'm voting no. So there was one no. Now we're going on to the lease. Okay, lease is, is an, another renewal of uh, our fitness center lease on uh, West Main Street. Um, the rent is increasing $50 a month. Um, it stays the same the second year, and then the third year it goes up another 50 And Questions? John. What's the lease amount of that building? It's $2,700. Um, it will go to $2,750 for... Uh, beginning in May, and then the next year it'll stay at 2750 and then the, the third and final year of the lease, it goes to 2800 Does it break even? Does what break even? The, the operations? Yeah. Um, we're, su we're supporting it a little bit through, uh, through our levies and through our, our programs um, all generate enough revenue to pay the instructors and that type of thing, but the facility itself, we're not covering the, all the costs on that. Even with the silver sneakers and that? Even with silver sneakers. Yeah. Further questions? 
Planet Fitness. Sorry. Anybody in the audience? Back to council. Move to approve. Second. And with, with emergency. With emergency. With emergency. With emergency. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Thank you. I can say aye once in a while. Okay, we're now to the employee to vote. Yes, so that was uh, an issue that you all asked us to take a look at and um, hope you know, kind of done a little more thinking on it. And, um, you know, as we, we said, uh, this is one of those things that often no good deed goes unpunished. And when, you know, so you try to anticipate the scenarios of how this plays out and how you can make it work so that it achieves the purposes of what you're trying to do, which was support civic engagement of your city employees, which we agree with too. We just want to make sure we can do it administratively. So Dave, Dave Coffey and his payroll issues doesn't become so complicated. And anyways, Hope's got some stuff, uh, some answers, some suggestions, and, and so we'll, I'll let her explain those. Um, yes. The Ohio Revised Code um, already requires the city to provide its employees time to vote if they, if they need to do that, as well as time to be poll workers and register people to vote, and I think to be... I think they're called poll challengers or something. But there is no requirement that the city pay them um, or give them, I'll call it free time off, as opposed to them using their own vacation or personal leave. Um, and what um, Ms. Rosenberg has uh, suggested is uh, giving city time off um, for employees to vote, and we can do that. And what I have done is I have provided council, and I am, there is a few typos in it, and I apologize, I'll fix those. I've provided council with an ordinance um, that would allow for um, each elector employee to get uh, two hours off each election day, whether that election day is a general, a primary, or a special election, uh, to vote at the employee's polling location. Um, however, I added this language because I want to make sure that police and fire and um, like in snow emergencies that um, our department heads are able to efficiently use our resources and our money in an effective way <coughs> to get our employees in and out um, to, to be able to go do this. So I indicated that each department head with the advice of human resources department shall implement procedures for the most effective use of labor and time to allow the elector employees to vote and to ensure that only elector employees are permitted time off. And I hate to say that, but you all know and I know that there's going to be someone that's going to ask for their two hours off because they live in Colga County and they went to vote, but, but we really need to also figure out, you, you know, you can, I, I can go and see if Dave is a voter here, and, and if, if he's a voter, that should be good enough. You want to go vote, you can go vote. So it should be a relatively easy way uh, for department heads or Suzanne to be able to uh, make sure that each person that gets the time off. Actually um, goes and votes. Yeah, um, yeah um, uh, either a sticker or um, that they're an elector, and if, if I think that even um, employees that don't live in this county, I think two hours is a sufficient amount of time for someone to be able to go and vote. And if it does take them longer than that, they can use their own time at that point. They do have an app on your phone. You can check anybody's. You do? Yep. Yep. Uh, <coughs> Jerry. Is this a violation of any of the union contracts that we have with the city. Oh, absolutely not. The only thing I, I did note in my, and, and I don't mean to be cynical when I say this, um, it, it's just, I've done this for such a long time. The only thing that I would say is, is typically giving employees who are in unions and expect for the city, I mean, they, they, uh, they, they fought for the right to be able to sit down and negotiate certain benefits. So typically as, as, a, as a lawyer for any city I've worked with, I've said, if you're going to give employees in unions more benefits, <laughs> wait till you sit down at the table and do it so you can get something back for it, possibly. Um, that certainly is not mandatory. If, um, if, if council, if you want this to uh, go in the white book and for us to provide this benefit to um, <coughs> unionized employees, I know that probably John you've got employees that work 24 hours a day. I'm, I'm sure you probably have worked with employees to get around this issue. Um, I will certainly make sure that we implement it 
with the union employees and I'll make sure that it gets in the collective bargaining agreements when we when we go back around the other question is we're talking about two hours is it possible to make it so they can go home two hours early to vote or are we talking about in the middle of the day or expanding uh, their lunch hour well, that would, what that are we would, doing um, that would be um, each department head working with Suzanne how, how does mm -hmm. how much sense does it make for John for the fire department I think that with overtime it would probably be easier for him to implement it especially for people who don't live in the city um, at the beginning of the shift and not allow them to say oh I'm, I'm going to go vote now um, we, we get to decide when you're going to vote if you if we're going to give you two hours time all right I'm done. <clears throat> So currently, right now, just to clarify, we essentially have our department heads and supervisors have like a, like with in the case of the, the fire department, just as an example, um, an informal kind of, hey, I'm going to go vote, uh, you know, kind of a situation. And this really just sort of formalizes that and says that mm -hmm. the city supports them exercising the, their right to go vote. And this is one way that we can do that. And still, they're still operating under you know checking with that supervisor making sure that it still fits within the course of the day yes okay. yes the only thing is is that when Dave now but I live in Franklin Township which is kind of far from here now when Dave allows me to go vote I have to use my own time vacation time now he'll have to give me two hours of vote time because it's going to take me two hours to vote at Franklin School right <laughs> With everybody else except Hope, I'll let them go ahead. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, true. I, so the answer to your question is, yes. yeah, I think for the yep. most part, department heads, supervisors, you know, the employee says, I want to go vote today, or, you know, okay, well, can you wait till 10? And yeah, and we're, and we're not necessarily, uh, not always requiring leave, you know, we'll say, hey, I'll shorten my lunch today. Okay, no problem. I worked last night. Okay, no problem. You know, I mean, it's kind of, it really depends on the type of work. Obviously, as Hope said, firefighters, police officers on a little bit more regimented kind of schedule, and we can't, it's a harder to be quite so free flowing. Um, but I'm sure they work something out. And this just, like you say, sort of creates a, a very clear procedure for how that can happen. So, you know, if a different supervisor came along and wanted to change the game today, they could. Or, and well, I guess they still kind of can in the, in the future too, because they still have ultimate say. But as far as leave use time, you're granting that that two hour block. So as, if, if somebody were out of leave, this would let that they can go vote. Yep. That's the idea. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. John, that's John going, then you guys over there. Okay. So, yeah, I know John. if I understand this right, we're going to, even though we have early voting, late voting, and absentee voting, we're going to allow someone to go out and vote for two hours, and, and we are or are not going to pay them. We are. They will not be required to use their own comp time or okay, vacation so time. It's going to be an average 30 to 40 bucks to go yeah. vote mm -hmm. as an incentive. And then, then we're going to follow up by checking the voters' roll, see if they really voted. Well, I can't, I, I've never noticed that you can actually see if someone voted in. Oh, yeah, you well, can. You can tell yeah. that they've voted. Yes. Where they vote at. And uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're we all know this. <laughs> okay. I, because I know that you can tell if someone is an elector. I didn't know if you could tell if they actually yeah. voted. Yeah. Okay. Afterwards. You can get their voting okay. record. Yeah. Yeah, after, after it's ratified. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> Not that anybody commit fraud. Oh, right. Jerry and then Garrett. Uh, the other well, question I have is now we have a couple different departments. I'm not going to pick on the fire or police, but they have Tuesday off. That's the voting day. What's the scenario? Say, well, my fellow, fellow employee got two hours to go vote. This is no. my off day. Where's my two hours? No, it's going. It, it, it will be more like a uh, funeral leave. I'm sorry. Just because my mom died and I get a day off doesn't mean you get a day off. All right. All right. I got it. Sure. Pointed reference. So if somebody doesn't have any administrative time, they can't go vote. Well, how many times has that ever happened? And right. With early voting, late mm -hmm. voting, and absentee, oh. and we that. don't know what we don't and know. What if, 
Is, is this really necessary? Um, it's a council motion. We're just responding. Yeah. Council requested this. So. You can vote absentee. I mean, seriously. Yeah. So you would tell John, do yeah. you have another question? Uh, yeah. I don't know off the top of my head know how many employees this <coughs> involved, but if you figure an average pay of about 20 bucks a head, how much money is that? Well, we've it's got, you know. I mean, thousands of dollars. Not everybody's going to take advantage of it. How many employees What's 20 times 200? 4,000? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you figure any given day, we probably have, what, 200 employees? The, the no, it's about 10 grand. Get that round number top of his head. No, it's not right. cash out. It's not cash out of pocket. Yeah. It's it's lost, it's time. lost time. Oh, but we're already informally letting this happen, correct? So this is just. I mean, we we already have some department heads that are that are allowing to say you need ten more minutes at lunch to vote. All right, this is just formalizing it, so it's mm -hmm. a yeah, maximum it's okay. <coughs> of two hours. You don't you don't automatically get a full two hours if you're like I'm coming in ten minutes later because of voting. It's just like all right, we're not going to dock your <coughs> vacation time by ten minutes because it's election day and you're voting. It's just formalizing it and actually making it something that we can track better correctly. Yes, and it's an alternative to some, I know some cities um, give election day off completely. Day off. It's a holiday, so. This would satisfy this, that without yeah, having an entire yeah, day Yeah, it's, I, I think it was the, um, it was the <laughs> kind of the compromise. True. Thank you. Garrett, what, would, would you consider giving them the two hours before or after with no pay and no, and no admit, no, not docking administrative time also, and, and you're not paying them to, if they take two hours, because my guess is if you give them two hours, they're going to take it, so then that's lost work time, but if you say you, exactly. can, you can have it, but it's not, it doesn't go against your administrative time, you have to file for it or ask for it, but it doesn't go against your administrative time, personal time, but you're not going to get paid for it either. I think that's an excellent idea. That's a pleasure for her. Would you be amenable to that? It's, it's, really it's still it's still subject to the, to the department head. I mean, if 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 somebody comes, if somebody comes along and says, "I'm going to leave right now. I don't <coughs> care what we're doing. I'm going to take my two hours and go vote. Get lost, buddy." That's not what's going to happen. This they is, can't do that now. This anyway. is well, they can't they they can't do that now. Um, this is like I said. This is just a. Uh, I, I think this just kind of formalizes something, and it makes it possible for for our employees to go vote. Sometimes you can miss absentee ballots and you can miss early voting and we're in a democracy and everybody deserves a chance to vote. I get to go vote whenever I want because I own my own business. I can walk out the door and go do that and I afford that to my employees as well. I'll let my employees not clock out and they can go vote. They're, they live close enough but they're still subject to me as an employer saying seriously come on go vote come back. But if there's a long line at the polls uh, you know sometimes that happens. We can have a presidential election where you're waiting and you need a little bit more time. I think that if this encourages people to go vote, uh, everybody should go vote. And, and if it removes even a teeny obstacle, um, I support it. Robin, do you have something? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think that's, you know, <clears throat> very progressive and forward looking. My problem is, uh, not my problem, I'm actually just kind of wondering. <clears throat> Is this a problem? I mean, I vote every time everybody else out there who's in the private sector finds a way to go vote. I think it's more of a, a <clears throat> we might get more pushback for doing that, <coughs> actually saying, you know, well, <coughs> we're going to give our people in two hours. That's a little expensive. Up to two hours? <clears throat> I, I just, I understand where you're going with, and I think that's really a good thing that you're thinking about that. <clears throat> but I, quite frankly, don't believe it's 
that big a problem that people can't find the time. We become more convenient uh, as a <clears throat> created a more convenient uh, atmosphere as it is for voting. You've got 30 days. You've got you know from the time voting opens till it ends, people can find a way to vote. They should find a way to vote. If they want to. If they want to. If they want to. I, 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 and I get what you're saying, and I, and I appreciate that. I just don't. He's asking if there's a need. I think that if people want to vote, they're going to vote, and those who, you can make it as convenient as you want to have it, and uh, because it is that now, I just don't see the necessity for it. I mean, it's just me. I, but I vote. All the time, never miss it when I was working, I'm retired, whatever. I always vote. I mean, if you want to find a way to do it, they've now expanded the, the window to do it. Are you voting for the right people? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> there further questions? Are you voting for the right one in this, this election? <laughs> Is there further questions? No. I'm good. Randy, you anything? <laughs> 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 she told me your name, so I said, okay. Uh, I move to, move to approve. Second. Second. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Get it. I, I, I can't support this in any way, shape, or form, and I, I want to give you my reasons why. You said can't? You said you can't. Wait, so you you can't. Just I can't. Well, okay. you just moved to approve. You made the motion. Yes. I yeah. can make the motion. And make the motion. It can fail. Yeah. Okay. I can do that. I think that's Robert's <laughs> that's reason for it. Allow me to do that. I want to be politically correct. And I don't want to take, I don't He's want to, just speaking against it. Yeah, I'm speaking against it. <laughs> I, to get I, it I out love, there. I love where it's coming from, from Gwen. But I'm going to tell you, I, I think we're adding a layer of bureaucracy to all of the people who are on the front lines like managers. I mean, I was a manager uh, of 150 people and <coughs> uh, adults and uh, on voting day, my job was to encourage them to go vote. We opened the polls at 6. They closed at, what, 7? 7. 7. Okay. 7.30. I, so that's the first issue. The second issue is, you know, there's always, a, there's always an image in the city that we're constantly fighting that city employees may not be working as hard as they should. And we're constantly trying to support our city employees and, and the image of our city employees and our taxpayers then say, but Roger, you know, I saw 10 guys out there and, you know, only two were, had shovels, right? And, and, and then people poor. hear that we're giving them two more hours off to go vote. I, I just struggle with that. I struggle with that whole thing. And, and please, don't make me turn in my Democratic Party card, okay? But the fact of the matter <laughs> is, is that I can't imagine this layer of bureaucracy over voting that we are taking the responsibility for and that responsibility belongs on the voter. And I think there are a lot of opportunities to vote. I mean, I used to work from here. I used to drive. I'd get up early and be there at 6 o'clock so I could make my 40-minute drive to go to my job because I wasn't going to get home until maybe 7.30 at night. I just, I just think this is, as much as I love what you're, what, where, where it's coming from, I just think that we're, it's a mistake. So that's, that's my two cents worth. You second it. I did. Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> I think that we already have department heads that people are right. using. The department heads are allowing people to go vote right now, currently. Right. All this does is put a cap on it and formalize it and allow them a tool with, in a structured framework that's Organize in a way and, and, and uh, takes into account the fact that you're letting that these people are going to go vote. That, that okay, hey, you need 10 minutes, you got to have 10 minutes. Uh, to say that every single person is going to take two hours to go vote, two hours is the cap. Most people are going to come in a few minutes late. They're going to go during lunch. Most people are going to go vote early, uh, perhaps as it works in their schedule. Uh, to come down on somebody who's working a full-time job and sometimes a 24-hour shift on election day, to come down on them that they didn't get their act together and go vote ahead of time, I think is part of the problem. I think that this is an affirmative action to encourage people to go vote. And 
regardless of people's perceptions of, of our city employees, I, I don't think that's a valid reason for, for not accommodating election day and doing what we can to encourage people to go vote. It is our primary form of uh, democracy, it's our primor, primary uh, right to exercise, and we should be doing what we can and setting an example then, uh, hopefully for other employ employers in the city to say, hey, it's election day. Did you go vote? Do you need 10 minutes? We can get you 10 minutes. Most people work hourly. It would be nice to set that example, um, you know, in a service industry downtown like we have, to say, hey, listen, if you need 10 minutes, you don't have to clock out. Take your 10 minutes and go vote. It's that important. And we should say it's that important. So Good that's why I support it. Good point. Yeah, I almost seconded this motion, and I support the motion, even if the person who made it doesn't. <laughs> I've never seen that before, Roger. Oh, really? Many times. Yes. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, come on. Just to get it off the floor. Right? All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I support it. And the reason why I support it is because I do think that we are employers. We always <clears> line <throat> up on that other side of the table when it comes to the employees. And I think this is a way of supporting our employees and setting an example for others, oh, being a leader in providing this ability, this option. And it's, so it's not up to whether your supervisor is nice to you or not. You, are, you would be able to do it, and I so wish that my employer would do that as well, and maybe they would if we have enough cities stepping up. We are the, the progressive employers. And you know, I, I think that that we set that we set that example. So I'm supporting it. Robin. I um, I'm gonna vote against it. Um, <clears throat> the bottom line for me is see that here's the big difference. The other employers, it's their money. We're working on government money, the people's dollar. That's a big difference, and I think that um, that's something we have to recognize. I mean, it's nice, nice that we're going to be, you know, be this kind of beacon to show people this is what they ought to do. But we'll do it when our money is in the game. This is not. <laughs> this is not our money. This is the people's dollar. Uh, and I, I agree with what Roger said. I really like the way you think. You're a very thoughtful and progressive person. But this is just, I don't know. I haven't heard of any uh, department heads that came and talked to you and said, this is a problem for me. We've got to be able to get out here and make sure that people can vote. I, I don't believe anybody did that. I, I think that, you know, you are that bright and forward thinking that you came up with it. But it's problematic, I think, for us as a body to go out here and say, we're going to give these people two, two hours off because we're the government. Uh, that's going to be a bigger issue for us down the road than you might know at this point in time. So, I mean, that's just my position on it, and I'll, I'll be voting Being against it. Yeah, uh, you know, I agree with uh, Roger. He put it eloquently. Hmm. The opportunity sure. to vote or not to vote. You know, my wife was in the intensive care for seven days, and while she was in there, she was able to vote. Uh, so, you know, it's not that tough. Been take two uh, hours to go. Pardon me? Couldn't take two hours out of the test for care? No, they didn't. No, she, matter of fact, in between pokes, <coughs> she was able to fill out the ballot. God bless her. Yeah. So I, yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, I'm not a gimme society guy. Further questions or further discussion? Randy? Actually, no, that was before you made the motion. Uh, I already did that one. Yeah, sorry. Back to Castle. <laughs> okay. Well, I just thought you may as well get in on this. All those in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Raise your hand, please. Three. All opposed? Aye. Fails. 
Now you can negotiate it into the contract. Can I put another motion on the floor? I'd like to make a motion. But you can make a motion. Yeah, I'd like to move that. Uh, uh, no, you can't do that. It's it's committee. It's not it's not council. Uh, based on this motion that just failed, I can't. No, I don't think so. No. No. Again, he wants to add. Back next year, let's make another motion. motion. No, no, you can't. I can't on this that just failed. No. Oh, okay. We're trying to ask the laundry. We can make another motion. Can he make a different another motion? No, or a different on twist on it. No. It failed. Mm -hmm. it he failed. wants to make another motion. No, he, sh he should have amended the right. motion. Come All back right. next year. You can do it in concert. No, I, had a, I had a solution. Oh, well. All right. Like the <laughs> okay, now we get to the best part of the night. <laughs> Please. Oh, wait a minute. I don't want to be a Joe Biden. You can do it. Uh, you can have more. <laughs> Yeah, budget amendment. How'd he get last on the agenda again? I just uh, don't so, understand. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, all is right in the world when Dave Coffey is last. So, motion to approve. Uh, motion to approve. <laughs> Second. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, Dave. He's got a big budget. <laughs> all right, what do you got for us? Move to approve. Uh, big surprise. <laughs> yeah. Done. Move to approve. Move to approve. Uh, already third at Tracy. It's important. Well, first of all, I hope you all will join me in uh, wishing Texas Tech good luck in their first ever yeah. Final Four appearance. Um, uh, I certainly will. Be he won't good. stop talking about it. Yeah, well, <laughs> on Saturday, on Saturday, I think it's five o'clock. Well, it's never mistaken. happened before, so let's give him a little something. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay, all right. But Texas other than that, um, I'm here to um, ask for your authorization, please, uh, for uh, the budget amendments as I've outlined in my March 27th memo to the city manager. Any questions? <laughs> Move to approve. Seconds. I was going to ask Randy if you had any questions. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Discussion? Long day, man. We already voted on it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Go Texas Tech. Yeah, we have executive session. Yeah. 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 The mask, the ball ball ball. Ball. The mask. If you put the mask on, you should have come up. Did yeah. you, you go to school there? Huh? Yeah. Did you go to school yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to say, we're going to be Congratulations. The first time I heard you make top session.